So it's time for our first panel to join and uh, they are going to discuss the presented findings and further explore how estimations how in their, how estimations can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions today and what more needs to be done. And for everyone, do not forget, if you have any questions for the panel, please add them to the uh, Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and the panel can look to address them. So the stage is yours, Eric. Um, please feel free to take the mic and introduce your panel. Thank you so much, Stefan. The other day I heard in a marketing climate conference in Spain a sticky phrase that roughly translates to English as brands without a cause, we simply pause. So it's actually great that the state of readiness report highlights that almost three quarters of businesses have started their journey towards CO2 reduction, indicating in fact a vast movement by the digital ad ecosystem towards more sustainable practice. I personally applaud the work that has been done by all these companies that were presented uh, that have pitched into the study and the gap analysis. It is so important for us. So to discuss exactly where we stand in the voice of the industry experts from different sides of the ecosystem, I'm actually thrilled to introduce to you our panelists today. So we have Anne Coughlin, co-founder and CEO at Scope3. We have Gregory Jamet product owner at DK. We have Emanuela Recalcati, Senior Director at Group M. And we have Vicky Foster, VP Global Partnerships at Adform. And I'm Eric Higblom, co-founder and CEO of Tribal Data and the president of IAB Spain's Sustainability Commission. To quickly kick off this panel, I would like to ask you all, panelists, thinking about the state of readiness report and the overview of the gap analysis that we just heard, what insights stood out for you the most? Perhaps, Anne, you would like to start. Sure. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much for inviting me to this panel today. My insight that I found really fascinating this morning was actually two different things that came up in the state of the readiness report and the gap analysis. And this was this idea of the challenge being a lack of transparency. So I think it was 77% of those uh, who participated in the state of readiness report said that this was a challenge. You heard Demetrius say that during the gap analysis, there's a significant emphasis on transparency, on documentation, and on this move to educate from all of the participants within the gap analysis. Analysis. So I think this is something that was super interesting for me as someone who lives and breathes methodology and estimation on a daily basis as part of the work that we do at Scope 3 to realize that there is a gap there between how we talk about the work that we do and how people perceive that and learn from that within the ecosystem. Eric, you're on mute. Gregory, we would like to uh, fill in on that. You're on mute as well, Gregory. Same mistake. <laughs> I was trying to use the, the keyboard, but it doesn't work. So thanks a lot for inviting me. And uh, I totally agree, indeed, because as someone who is always checking data from customers and making sure that everything is aligned with our methodologies, I was assuming that the transparency about how it works was totally okay. But indeed, I think that there is still a, a lot to do about that, making sure that people do understand how we work and what is the purpose of using this data. This is really for the good purpose. And also maybe making sure that all the company involved in this are for the right purpose. I think that being transparent, being collaborative is the, the most important. We do, for example, provide some one-shot audit or some consulting that can help at least to start with something. I think starting with something is the, the most important thing. So on collaboration, um, Vicky, Emanuela, you'd like to talk about how this is tangibilizing into the clients? Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Yeah. I think for me, it's we're seeing, we obviously have scope three fully integrated within our UI. So we were the first DSP to do that. We're most definitely seeing client uptake. We've had about 138 campaigns go live and we've really seen some reduction in carbon emissions where on average, we've been able to see that reduction of around 53%. I think for me, what really stood out and the insight there was that for me, the action isn't enough. 
I think the talk is there around clients saying that it's one of the, the top three challenges. But actually, when you then look, and I, I wrote it down, there's still only 18% of businesses um, signed up to various um, companies. So I think that's another challenge that we're facing. Um, so I think we've really got to see more companies signing up to the science-based target initiative, really looking at the framework. And for me, that really stood out. There's a lot of talk, but not as much action. Uh, I agree. So it was, for me, it was super interesting to see, for example, 70% of the companies are starting to make, to make something, some progress, but I feel like there is a long way to go. And I wasn't totally surprised about the comments around transparency and um, methodologies because it is a minefield. So I've been, I've been managing and driving the strategy for sustainability at Group M for the last year. And for me, it's been a very interesting journey. And at the beginning, it was, has been a journey where it felt very complex, very vast. So we really needed to educate ourselves and start to understand where we could really drive an impact and start to talk with industry body also with Anne was there from the beginning with us and it was has been a very interesting journey where there is a lot a lot to learn and a long way to go thank you manuela i guess it's a silent movement that is happening there's a lot of work on the back and uh, then you have the whole client conversation and, and just multi-dimensional it could start with anything from green rushing going down to doing the things in a, in a cleaner way uh, one of the key findings uh, of the study is that um, the highest priority for the industry is adopting solutions to reduce greenhouse emissions, and this under a consistent standard. What's the current uptake, would you say? I think you, you painted a picture of that a little bit, Vicky, from your side, but what is the current update on the solutions and how can the industry navigate greenhouse emissions estimations with so many solutions that are available? I don't know who wants to kick this off, perhaps Emanuela? Uh, so we see that really a small percentage, I think it was about 30 of the company made some significant progress and are adopting solutions. So I think that's not, that's an encouraging start, but we are not there yet. What we, the way we look at from my experience, we needed to start to look at building a framework in an internal framework on when it comes to to measurement or to action actions one of the things that was very clear for us from the beginning for example it was that we didn't want to build a green product we didn't go, want to give advertiser the option to go green product or not what we wanted to do is to embed sustainability into everything that we do so the approach that we took, it was really to start to look at what are the practices that we can put in place, measurement, and then potential optimization opportunities, opportunities around that. So for us, it was really looking into each step of the programmatic chain and understand what are the things that we can do, what are the practices that we can adopt at scale in order to reduce emissions. Anyone else cares to fill in? Yeah, I'm happy to. Sorry, Anne, I think you were. You go. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, as I've said, we've seen some great adoption on the kind of advertising and kind of commercial side. There's still more to do. And I think collaboration is super important. We work very closely with Scope 3. They're fully integrated, as I said, within our UI. I think if you're to ask any client, they will go, yeah, of course, I want to reduce my, my carbon emissions. Everyone wants to do the right thing, but we can't ignore the ROI. We can't ignore the performance factor. We've really worked hard to ensure that, yes, we can reduce carbon carbon admissions, but we can also maintain or improve on ROI. The other bit, just before I hand over to Anne, is that, yes, we've worked on that side of things, but also for us, it's very much a holistic view across our entire business. So we have an ESG steering committee. It's made up of C-suite. Our CEO is involved in that, and we have an ESG lead. And I think that's super important that this has to be embedded right throughout the business. 
Yeah, just to build on what Vicky said, I think one of the opportunities in the state of readiness report was around this, the fact that there is opportunity for profit and thinking about sustainability is vital for businesses in most cases versus it being considered as a threat. And I think for us, when we're speaking to our partners and when we're speaking with them to to marketers, the idea that by focusing on sustainability, you will also see positive impacts to your business. The drivers of growth can be sustainable too. That is a light bulb moment that we see where it means that this suddenly isn't like a a side job. It's something that you can build into your marketing best practices that can see outsized impact. So waste reduction from a carbon perspective can also mean waste reduction from redundant outcomes, low, low. I think that's a super important message at the end of the day that climate efficiency and campaign efficiency can go hand in hand. Because if you think about it, a lot of the processes that we can get better at, we can build efficiencies in it, that generates less energy demand. There are a lot of solutions around there now with the ones that we've uh, reviewed um, uh, in the working group that are are addressing this. They can go hand in hand. So I think that's quite an important um, conclusion. Now, we did speak, I think Emanuela pointed to that as well, that there there are also some, she pointed that adoption could be greater by brands. What do you guys think are the current barriers hindering further uptake to solutions? Anyone cares to jump in, Anne, perhaps? Yeah, I think um, definitely a... Lack of education, a lack of awareness, um, and going back to that point around a lack of recognition that this could actually help me achieve my goals as a marketer um, by by itself. I think that is something that we see as being key. And Eric, you talked earlier about this kind of waiting for standards. I think hopefully this time next year, we won't be talking about that anymore as the GARM process concludes. I think a wanting to do the right thing has been hindering people if they are waiting indeed for standards. And I think what we're seeing um, at Scope 3 is that we're pretty close to that time now where we'll see those. And as long as a marketer is highly confident that their partner will adhere to those standards once they come out, that shouldn't be a barrier to kickstarting looking for the right solution now. So education standards, um, and I think the work of the, the gap analysis has been super robust. I was personally quite surprised about the level of detail in, in which they've gone in to sort of provide this gap analysis. Anyone cares to add any more barriers or do we all agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Sorry, I agree with what Anne said there. But I think I think what we're seeing is everyone got so hyped up by sustainability last year. And as it was stated at, at the beginning, uh, it's not a buzzword. Um, it very much has a place in, in what we need to do and our, our future. But I think a lot of brands have maybe got a bit nervous around sort of the framework, around the regulations, around the legal requirements. And actually, they're they're maybe holding back a little bit because they're nervous about greenwashing around the output and and, and what they could be called out on potentially for. And I think that's a shame because as it was touched on earlier, this is about collaboration. This is about a journey and we're all learning through that process. So I would really call for more businesses to be on that journey with us and collaborating and learning as much as we can and educating each other. I think, Gregory, you wanted to ask something or, or say yeah, something. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. It was uh, the exact time that my internet connection decided to stop. So <laughs> I missed something like five minutes of this conversation. I'm really sorry. So I hope I won't uh, say again uh, what was uh, said before. Uh, yeah, especially regarding the uptake of the solutions. What is interesting is, I don't know if someone spoke about uh, the SRI initiative in France, which has been launched last year, and we have good signs here. The good, thing is that, the good thing is that three months after it was launched, we could see that 70% of the, of the, of the um, networks or the sales house have adopted this, these solutions to measure the greenhouse emissions. Not all of them are customers of us, of course, but some are making sure that at least the measure, and I think that this is the first step, and this is really the first step to measure and reduce 
and making sure that there is more and more collaboration. I know it's hard, and I know it's hard because it's not easy to share your data with some other uh, companies, especially if you consider a strategy or something like that. But uh, this is the first step, and I think it's the most important step. I will say, I will agree on that. I think collaboration is the key and share because the way I see and the way we are approaching sustainability is that it's not something that needs to give you a competitive edge. It's something that we need to address as an industry. We need to come together. We need to be very transparent on the learning that we are getting um, with our clients in order to, to build something that will future-proof um, our industry our, and our planet, really. This should become as natural as protecting the brand or anything else like that. It's a hygiene factor that we need to take into consideration. I think the double somersault in the sense is as well that we need to change our behaviors as well and how we act internally in the company. So that's what makes it a little bit more challenging. I think time is, we have a little bit of time left and there's one very, yeah, I think Anne pointed to that in terms of profit, right? Why should all players in the ecosystem prioritize today greenhouse gas emissions estimation for systemic decarbonization. What are the concrete advantages to companies that, that adopt this? Does anyone want to jump into this? I think, so for me, on the why, I think we have, we haven't taken accountability as an industry on the impact that carbon emission has or what we do. So we celebrated this very super busy ecosystem without really understanding the negative impact that we had on our planet. And so for me, we now have that level of insight that help us understanding what good advertising is and what good, bad, good, good and bad practice are and the impact. And um, for example, one of the things that our motto uh, internally is uh, fewer better ads. And for me, it's really about respecting um, the users. It's about um, supporting good quality publishers and it's about driving good positive outcome um, for our clients. And I think this is going to drive overall better, a better ecosystem, more sustainable advertising ecosystem, but it's going to have for sure a better impact uh, on the planet. Yeah, I completely agree. I always visualize a Venn diagram of overlapping issues and selfishly put sustainability at the core of being able to solve a lot of those and absolutely love that. Fewer, better ads. Fewer, better ads that users actually see and interact with and engage with uh, that don't generate tons and tons of carbon is surely the, a better way for everyone to be thinking about the advertising ecosystem that we all work in and want to evolve to still be here and be you know, positively impacting our lives and society's lives uh, in years to come. Yeah, and I think the, the quality kind of content and journalism is super important because ultimately our whole ecosystem is built on that from an advertising perspective. So I think we've definitely seen in, in what we've been doing that we have been driving that from the work that we've been doing. So I think that's super important. And as we've already touched on as well, there are so many kind of business um, opportunities and profitability that can come out of this as well. So it is obviously about doing the right thing as well, but also we can see the business upside to this, which is again, super important. I totally agree. And uh, I think also that we are pretty lucky in the digital industry because we have a lot of data which is available. And with this data, we can calculate, estimate, and reduce the emission. I think we need to act now and make sure that, once again, transparency, collaboration is, is online to make sure that the reduction of greenhouse gas is on the good way. Wouldn't you say that there's also a clear advantage on companies being more responsible? At the end of the day, we have uh, new EU directives coming in. Large advertisers will need to start reporting scope three emissions where advertising and digital advertising is placed. And that can come quite quickly in a sense. There's times to adopt to that when it becomes transposed to national laws. That has been the case already in France from December last mm -hmm. year. And there needs to be a connection between the CSR function of, of, of corporates and, and the marketing function. 
to be able to efficiently report back. If you are a brown company, a brown advertiser, you're not likely to get a lot of capital from the capital markets. Do you have anything to say around that? I think that this law is, in a way, a good decision because those days, sustainability is not yet a priority project for exec team or management. With this change, we can see that, of course, they already have some teams that are dedicated to this topic, but they have a lot of topics beside this one. So most of the time they are running after data, running after resources that they don't have, and they are really trying to make the best effort. So at least I would say that this this new law that is, yes, uh, as you said, already active in France, will help to put the this topic as a top priority for all the teams inside the company. Yeah, and I think for IAB Europe members, many ad tech companies, we're seeing as we, we partner with many and some on this call, that there is increased ask from the buy side of the ecosystem to understand the credentials of their supply chain partners and making sure that they are walking the walk as well as talking the talk and making sure that they're choosing partners that they will they see as core to their own sustainability success as they continue to grow and develop their businesses and it becomes not just a box ticking exercise it becomes something that companies have to do to win business and we'll see that directly as a reason and a, from the regulation itself I think it's so you can, as as an advertising brand, you can avoid sanctions for non-compliance and reporting, but there's also an evident benefit and actually being a brand with a course that supports a course that is committed, that is responsible in all their different business lines and across their operations. As I was saying, brands without a course, we simply pause. It's particularly important for the younger generations that are coming in. Those are the future buyers of a lot of the brands. Um, I think we've, I don't know if anyone wants to say anything else or we should open the floor for if there's any questions, Stefan, I don't know, that have come in. Yeah, we have one question, but I don't know exactly if it could be possible better addressed to, to Ines uh, on policy side, or does anyone in the panel wants to discuss policy things? Or do you see the question from about policy changes? I do see the question. I feel like we've half answered it just now. Yeah. Yeah. So probably let's stay stuck with this. And now we can see probably Ines can address it as well from her perspective. So yeah. Um, thank you, Eric, Anna, Emanuela, Craig, and Vicky. Great to, it was uh, great to hear uh, your uh, perspective on uh, estimation strategies. Um, uh, as we have no more questions so far, I, I just want to highlight from my perspective one thing as an employee of a publisher that has been uh, publishing an increasingly growing sustainability report for many years already uh, i would like to add that a lot of uh, sustainability work starts with oneself and as soon you really have started to bring your own house in order many will see this could be complex and challenging especially in times of challenges in economic uh, developments and at least I think that's how I explain for, uh, for me the discrepancy sometimes between perceived and real transparency and also between needed and um, real integration of, of products. But things moving on and yeah, sustainability can really be a minefield, which is uh, why there's not only green washing, but also green hushing on the other side. If you don't know, this is uh, when companies purposely keeping quiet about their sustainability goals and developments. And I don't know in any other field of, of, of businesses where we have to these extreme de uh, developments. 